All right. If you would, again, please open with me to Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 32 this morning. I've kind of uh, entitled this message, it's, it's Worse Than You Think, part one of a thousand. Um, <laughs> I know. Uh, you, the cup is always half empty. I know. Sorry. But if you remember last seven day, we left off in verse 20 of chapter five, where Jesus said to his disciples, for I tell you that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, as we discussed last Sunday, the scribes and the Pharisees, they were the, um, they were the religious leaders of the day. They were the lawyers. They were the teachers. They were the interpreters of the law of Moses in the prophets and being those religious leaders, they were the ones who not only interpreted, but they also modeled what the scriptures were to the people. Um, obviously their leadership is, is supposed to do that, especially uh, spiritual leadership. And the, the problem was that they had taken the law of Moses and had interpreted it in such a way that it was focused on the external keeping of the law. Uh, what we, what you do, what is seen before others. And that's kind of, that's kind of what they did. And so uh, there was an external righteousness about them, a self-righteousness about them. Uh, any, can anyone else relate? Yeah, hopefully. Uh, but God also requires in this law, an internal righteousness. It's not that we, you know, just forget about the, what we do, but there also has to be a pure motive, a pure attitude, a pure heart within us. And this is also what the law requires. But guess what happened is the uh, Pharisees conveniently left that out. They didn't focus on the internal requirements. They just focus on the external. And so they had an external righteousness deeds that were done in a very visible way, according to the law. But what was going on in their hearts was an attitude that neglected the heart of the law, the heart of what God was asking. And Jesus is talking to his disciples up on the mountain uh, over there, overlooking the sea of Galilee. And he wants them to know that what he's teaching and what he's saying it isn't radically departing from the law of Moses. Actually, what he's, what he's teaching and what he's saying and what he's going to do is actually going to fulfill the heart of the law. But all these guys had heard is what the actual teachers of the day were teaching. And so that was their understanding. That was their theology. It was an outward emphasis. And what Jesus was doing was something radical. He was actually bringing the heart and the intent of the law before his people and say, this is what God meant when he said that. It's pretty convicting. And while Jesus was the one who fulfilled the law and the prophets in his own actions, the prophecies concerning him, again, we've talked about the road, of, road to Emmaus, where Jesus took those disciples and he showed them all the scriptures, starting with the law and then the prophets, and he showed them all that, how they were fulfilled in him. And so there's that sense in which he came to fulfill the law and the prophets, but he also fulfilled them morally and perfectly the heart and the intent of what God had had. But listen, it doesn't stop there. Jesus now turns to his disciples and said, the same thing is going to happen with you. Not that you are the Messiah, anything like that, but that my spirit in you is going to produce this kind of internal righteousness, these kind of outward actions this is what's going to happen. And this is what required. And if you want to, here's the, it, it, it's worse than you think verse, just skip down to verse 48. This is the bookend of the whole thing. He sums up everything he's talking about. He says, therefore in Matthew 5, 48 says, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. So he's, he's all the teachings we're going to talk about. He goes, You've got to be perfect like your heavenly father is perfect. Now, I don't know about you, but at that point, my heart just sinks. Anyone else? You see, the righteousness required by God is his righteousness. Internally and externally. The kingdom of God, in order to enter the kingdom, you must be pure of heart. Who will ascend to the, the hill of the Lord? You know, who will abide in his presence? He who is clean and is pure of heart, who has not lifted up his soul to any idols, nor speaks what is false. He'll receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God, right? Who's going who's gonna to be able to ascend? The one who is perfect. This is Paul's big thing in Romans. All have fallen short of the glory of God. Amen? And if you're saying, no, I, can, I think I, I've done pretty well. <laughs> well, you're in the wrong building. 
<laughs> You're among the wrong people. Um, not saying we relish in that, but we know it. And so what God is requiring is a righteousness that exceeds that of the, of the scribes and the Pharisees, not just an external righteousness in what you do, but a, an internal righteousness, a good tree bearing good fruit. As Jesus would say, a genuine right standing with God in an authentic right living with God inside and out. That's what God requires. Jesus said, therefore you must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Now, Again, that should make all of us shudder when we read that. Amen. Is everybody just kind of getting real nervous? Like I can't make, that's, I'm not going to make it. That is not me. I have not been that person. Although I aspire to, and I desire to be, I fall short of the glory of God. It was worse than the disciples thought as they're sitting there. And their only reference is, is pretty much the teacher of Israel. And externally they were flawless. They were the superstars of the culture. And they were looking at them going, man, there's no way. It's like, you've got a dunk like Jordan every time. It's like, oh, but I'm like five foot. <laughs> and I've grown out, not grown up. You know, it's like, it's not going to work. <laughs> not going to work. But here's the thing. What was required of them, God would supply to them. What God asked them to do, he would empower them to do. And, and that righteousness that they needed was standing right in front of them or sitting right in front of them. And he was speaking to them. It, Jesus would not only fulfill the law and the prophets, and he was when he was speaking to them and he did in his life and he culminated on the cross. He would fulfill all righteousness as Jesus prayed and in, in the in uh, John 17, his high priestly prayer the night before. I've got to fulfill all righteousness, Father. Let it be done according to your will. But he would also freely give them his righteousness. This is what it is to be in Christ, church. It's not our righteousness. He did it for us, and it's faith through him that we are made righteous. It's amazing. That's our right standing with God. Righteousness is right standing with God in one sense, but it's also right living. That right standing with God produces a right living with God. And Jesus gives us the right standing and he puts his spirit within us for the right living. That's Romans chapter eight, life by the spirit his power to live a righteous life inside and out. So that's the big picture. Lest we get some idea that Jesus is telling us that if we do these things that he's going to describe that we're going to then attain this righteousness. We've got to make that clear. We're not going to attain that righteousness, but through faith in him, he empowers us to live righteously, not just to fulfill the law, but to fulfill the law of love. And that's a whole nother sermon as you get into Romans, but it's not a, an earned righteousness, but it's given to us. It's an imputed righteousness, a something that he takes from his account and puts into our account. A righteousness that is by faith and his spirit dwells within us. And as we abide in him, he empowers us to live the life that we could not live apart from me. You can do nothing but abide in me and what happens? There's fruit that happens, the fruit of the spirit. And as Paul said to the Philippians, I love this Philippians two thirteen. If you need a, a verse to dwell on this week for, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. It is God who works in you, not only to will it, but to do it. Why? For his good pleasure. God doing that work in his people. Now, does that mean we get a ticket and we get to back away and say, oh, you know, say by grace, don't need to do anything. No, he says faith without works is dead, right? We live out this life by faith. And this is what Jesus is saying. Your righteousness has to exceed that. The Pharisees, you don't have it. I'm going to give to you what you cannot do, but through me, you will be able to do this. And so Jesus said to his disciples, hey, man, you're not going to make it unless you're better than the Pharisees. And again, the picture is that he's going to give them the better. And now Jesus begins to describe how is disciple, how a disciples of Jesus Christ are to live righteously as members of the kingdom of God. How are they to live this out? And so now in the remainder of the chapter verses, chapter, verses 21 through 48, Jesus gives us six examples 
uh, of the righteousness that God requires in our lives. I'll just take one probably this morning, maybe two, and then we'll get the rest next time. So starting in verse 21, Jesus says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. How many of you have heard the commandment? You shall not murder. Yeah, that's one of the Ten Commandments, right? We get that out of Deuteronomy uh, yeah, or Exodus, actually Deuteronomy and Exodus. Exodus 20, 13, you should not murder. And so uh, obviously this is God's command. It's the word of God. It stands. But then uh, the second part of the quote, whoever murders will be liable to judgment. That was a rabbinical interpretation that kind of came forward. And it falls way short of what God intended when he commanded man not to murder. God's not saying if you murder, you're going to face the court. That's that, that word for court is local court. It's like, well, that's true. Yes, absolutely. But that's not the heart and the thrust behind the law. Listen, if you murder someone, you're going to get in trouble and we'll make sure you get in trouble for it. There's going to be consequences that that although that's true, that's not what God meant by this. And so. If we just hear the first part, you know, hey, do not murder. Most of this room, most of this room, I don't want to say that God says that some have been murderers and they've been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. But most people, I think, aren't murderers. And you could raise your hand and say, I've kept the command. I am not a murderer. And you can walk away going, I've kept that command. Pretty cool. You know, and there's a sense of self-righteousness. There's a sense of I have kept this. And that was the extent of the teaching that the Pharisees had. Do not murder. Well, I haven't murdered. I'm good. I've kept it. Yay. Great. And so we all rejoice that we haven't criminally taken someone's life. And that's what murder is. It's not talking about, you know, people go, well, government's executing people and all this kind of stuff. Now we can get into all that stuff, but murder is criminally taking someone's life. And that's what he means. Governments are required by God to kill murderers. If they don't, it's unjust. I know we've got all these types of things, but that's what's required They're for governments, not for us, for governments. The problem is if you have an unjust government, then you've got issues. And that's what we all worry about, right? That's a different discussion. <laughs> all right. So, so, Hey, I, I love it. You know, you can sit around in a room and, and say, Hey, thou shalt not murder. Are you for or against capital capital uh, punishment? It's like people go, yeah, man, we need to, we need to clean up the mess. And then they go, Oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you, you were in, you're in North Korea. Oh, wait, I don't want to have capital punishment now. Because you have an unjust government. So that's a whole different discussion. What it's talking about is murder, killing someone criminally. And most of us could say, hey, you know what? We're, we're good. But there's a problem here. We have an issue because Jesus clarifies what God is looking at in verse 22 when he says, you shall not murder. He says, but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to hell of fire, right? So we've got a, we've got a problem, Houston. Jesus isn't looking at the physical act alone. Jesus is saying that everyone who has anger in his heart towards his brother slash sister you're going to be liable to judgment. It isn't just the act of murder that God is looking at. He's actually looking at the root of murder. And most murder is caused by anger in our hearts towards one another. It isn't just the physical act. It's the root that God is looking at. Now, not all anger is sin, by the way. There's righteous anger. But I would say that that's very seldom what is going on in our hearts. We struggle with selfish anger is what we struggle at as a people. Anyone? Okay. Just a couple of us. Three, four. Okay, great. Okay. But you know what we're saying? We struggle with selfish anger. Something that happens that we don't want to have happen. That, and we start to get mad at angry at someone else. And we start to fester and all that kind of stuff. Righteous anger. Jesus walks into the house of God and he sees what's going on and he cleanses the temple with all the money changing and stuff. That's Jesus. He has a righteous anger. When we see that children are abused or molested, there's a righteous anger that wells up within us. That is a righteous anger, but be angry and do not sin. Leave judgment to God. Leave it to the government. By the way, he was called by God to execute that judgment. So I'm just saying that 
There is righteous anger. We do have righteous anger that's going on, but be very careful not to justify your anger with righteous anger because quite often it's, it's wrapped up in selfishness. And our hearts are weird, desperately wicked, right? We can spiritualize things that God would want to call out. But most of the anger we experience is selfish. And the anger that Jesus is speaking of here when having anger over anger over brother, it is a brooding anger. It is a seething anger. It is a boiling anger. It is, a, is an anger that is rooted in bitterness in our hearts. An unresolved anger. The kind of anger that leads out to manifestations of that anger, both in what we say and, and what we actually physically do. And the root of it causes the physical act of it. And so God, when he says, do not murder, he's talking about the whole package. Anger is an accomplice to murder. According to God, having this kind of anger in your heart towards a brother or sister, that term brother or sister is used in, in the sense of fellow countrymen here. It's saying people you dwell with. And that doesn't mean it excludes your physical brothers or sisters or brothers and sisters in the church. It's just saying, man, you've, if you've got anger in your heart, seething towards people around you, man, you are liable for judgment before God. Jesus then goes on from the root to the symptoms. You've got anger, not only anger, but how often the anger is shown? How is anger manifested? Ask any police officer. How do domestic, domestic violences start? There's anger towards one another. And then, they, then someone starts spewing their anger towards the other person. It's quite often what happens. And so he says there in the middle of verse 22, whoever insults his brother slash sister will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to hell fire. And by the way, those words, uh, uh, judgment, council, and hell fire, those are escalations of court. Uh, and, and that's a different study. I didn't get into it too much, but the idea there is it starts out civil and then it goes to the Supreme court, that word right here where it says you'll be liable to the council. That's Sanhedrin. That's the council of the 70. That's the highest law of the land. And then it goes into where he says you fool. And obviously who's that talking about being danger of hellfire? That's, that's God. Right. So judgment all the way around. And, and I won't get into that this morning, but anger spreads. It spreads to insults, insulting people. And then it insults to slander. So you're talking, uh, you're, you're saying wicked things to people, but then it's also slander talking about them behind their back. All these are accomplices to murder in the eyes of God. Those attitudes and those words, uh, those actions are complicit in murder before God. And the law's intent was not just to address the act of murder. Obviously it is, but the heart and its attitudes and its expressions, the root of murder. And so God says, do not murder in your heart and in your attitudes. Now, how many of us have that going on in us? That's the question. You see, the law kind of goes out and it kind of, it's not, it's to reveal that we have sin in us. That's what Paul says, right? So what people group are you talking about behind your back? What kind of seething anger do you have someone, a neighbor who did something to you? You know what I'm saying? Someone in this room, perhaps. And you just kind of let it sit. You let it simmer and it's still there and you see them and you avoid them and all this kind of stuff's going on. Maybe they don't even know about it. Or maybe you both have decided to brush it under, under the rug. Well, Jesus gives us two examples on what we do about that. Ready? Verse 23. So if you're offering your gift at the altar and there, remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. And first be reconciled to your brother and then come off of your gift. That's what Jesus says. Jesus makes it clear to his disciples that reconciliation with our brothers and sisters goes before we worship God. 
reconciliation before worship. How many of us like the, con the uh, convenience of worshiping without reconciliation? <laughs> God says, nope, nope, not going to handle it. Right now, what Jesus says here, it ties into the story of Cain and Abel. How many of you are familiar with the story of Cain and Abel back in Genesis chapter four? You can flip over there. I'm going to reference it. But Genesis chapter four, first book in the Bible. Remember in Genesis four, Cain and Abel are two brothers, the, 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 the sons of Adam and Eve, right? And it zeroes in on them. It doesn't talk about all the other brothers and sisters. It talks about them. This is the first murder we have in, in scripture. And so what happened is one day they decided to both come and worship God. And, and Cain, he was a farmer. And so he brought his offering from the field and he brings his, his fruit and his veggies and all the things that he, he pulled out of the ground and he, and he offers it to God. And then, and then there's Abel, his brother and Abel was a shepherd. And so he brings a sheep and he brings the best of his, if his, and he offers it to God. He offers this animal to God. Now, many people focus on the offerings and not on the person. And I don't think that's what's going on here. I don't think it's the offerings. Although we look at the example of a blood sacrifice and we see that as an acceptable offering in scripture. But guess what? There's also grain offerings and things like that that were given. So I, you can draw that theology out all the way through scripture about the blood of sacrifice only being the acceptable one. And that's why God rejected Cain and his offering. But it says that God re rejected Cain and his offering, but Abel and his offering, he accepted. That's what he said. And so what we need to know is that it wasn't, it didn't say that God rejected Cain's offering. It said it rejected Cain and his offering. He erected the, he, the, the, the package is tied together there. And when Cain has his offering rejected, it says in there, Genesis four, five, that when, when God rejects Cain's offering and he and his offering, it says that Cain was what he became, what very angry now livid, furious, sim it's the kind of anger we're talking about, Right. He was very angry and his face fell. His countenance fell. And so why I asked the question, why did God reject Cain and his offering? Why was it going? Because the offering wasn't acceptable. And then Cain got mad. Is that what's going on? God said to him, what does God ask? He goes, why are you what? Why are you angry? God has a masterful way of getting to the heart of what's going on in us. You see, I believe that Cain had anger in his heart towards his brother when he came to offer it. And God did not accept that offering because of the anger that was in Cain's heart. Same principle Jesus is talking about here in Matthew 5. Same writer, same author. Amen. God said to him, Cain, why are you angry and why is your face fallen? Here's the key, verse 7. If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you give me a better offering, won't you be accepted? Do you think that's really the issue? Could be. But if you keep reading, there's a context. What does it mean if you do well? Something wasn't going well in Cain's life. God sees, continues to talk to him. He says, and if you do not do well, sin is what? Crouching at your door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Listen, Cain, the reason why I, ex I, I didn't accept it is because you are not doing well. In what way? Well, sin is crouching at your door. You've got something going on in your heart that's about to spring forward unless you address it. I'm not accepting your offering because you're not right with your brother. That's what I believe is going on there. And how do we know that? You keep reading. And what does he say in verse eight? Chapter four, Cain spoke to his brother, Abel. That word spoke. If you look, there's a little letter there and also says it's translated. He led them, he led him into a field. Spoke means he kind of pulled him out into a, into a wilderness area. There's a Hebrew thing going on there. 
And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. You see, anger and bitterness and malice in our hearts towards one another, it's unacceptable to God. And we've all fallen short in this area. We've all at one time or another struggled with anger and unforgiveness. And it doesn't matter what we're offering. It doesn't matter if we're offering a lamb or if we're offering, you know, the fruit of whatever we do. You know, we can sing songs and we can give money to the church and we can go and give to the poor. We can do a bunch of worship related things that God does require of us. By the way, don't dismiss those things, the righteous deeds, the righteous actions. We can do those things and have that external righteousness going on. But man, in our hearts, we're, we're messed up before God. Anyone relate? But if we have anger in our hearts towards our brothers, God requires that we do well. We do well. Then we will be accepted, not in the sense that we're not saved or not, but then that beautiful relationship flows between us and God. Make sense? How many of us have kids that go berserk and then they want to spend time with you, but the issues aren't resolved? It's hard to have fellowship. Does that make sense? Until that's dealt with in our hearts. We've all experienced that with one another, with maybe relatives or relations or whatever it is. It's like there's, there's something that's not resolved there, and yet you've got to go do functions together. It's like, what's the point? How much more so with God? Listen, he, he didn't create us to, to have distance from us. For us to live in darkness while dwelling with him, he wants fellowship with us. Amen? And in, in that fellowship, there's light. And he goes, I'm not going to let you go ahead and, and live that way. You want a fellowship? I'm going to allow you to be miserable <laughs> until that's addressed. And so why? Because you know what goodness is. Come to me, go to your brother and, and resolve this issue that's going on. Jesus says the same here. First be reconciled to your brother, then come worship. Amen. Then it's accepted. Now, by the way, this verse can be taken two ways. If you have done something and remember that you have done something against your brother. So um, you're in the wrong. There's a, there's a sense in which you're in the wrong. Hey, listen, if, if, you've, if you're there worshiping and you remember your brother has something against you, like, oh, yeah, I did that to them. God's bringing to mind something you've done against them. That was sin. He says, leave the whole religious thing, the worship thing. He says, drop it at the altar. Go make it right. Worship me that way. <laughs> right? And then come back and take care of it. So in that sense, right? But there's also the sense, well, you're, you're there and you're worshiping and you remember your brother has something against you. Now, which is it? Like they've got something against you or you've done something against them that they, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Regardless, if it's them who has something against you or you who has something against them, you go to them. Church, this is something we as elders have learned and are trying to communicate in us with our disagreements with one another. People are waiting for people to come to them. You go to them. You be the peacemaker. Why is that? Who came to us first? <laughs> Remember, we've wronged God. Remember that? <laughs> Anybody? You know? We've wronged God and we were out doing our thing. And who came into our life to come grab us and free us from that? Who, who did that? The Lord. And, and as we've experienced that grace as, as Christians, as we've experienced his mercy, as we've experienced the cross, as we've experienced those things, who are we to hold something over someone else? Yeah, things that people do are wrong. And I'm not justifying any of that. But there's a big giant looming cross, amen? So when we are wronged, we are to go to them. Knowing that God saved us and knowing how he views anger in our hearts towards one another, love would go free that person from their anger, would go be a peacemaker. Make sense? What's keeping you from doing that? Answer that question in your heart. That's what God's drilling in on. If you want to leave now, you can. 
And by the way, lest I, <laughs> yeah, he's like, yeah. Now listen, I'm not sitting here preaching at you. I'm, 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 the word's cutting me on this stuff. Amen. Like there's, there's issues that have gone on in, 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 in our lives that are the, the Lord speaking to us on this one. Listen, pastor, don't let that root of bitterness fester in your heart. Don't do that. Do what I say to do. It's good for your soul. Don't let anger hang out in there. And let me tell you, it's not easy. It's not easy. Especially when the other person's in the wrong, right? Of course they always are. <laughs> but I mean, praying, God, don't let this manifest. And how many of you go do it, but it still pops up? Anyone else? Keep running to the Lord. Keep running to him. Keep crying out, asking. Don't let my heart grow hard. Don't let this root of bitterness take hold. Don't let me talk this way about this person. Don't let anger fester in my heart. Don't do that, Lord God. Remind me of your cross. Do what only you can do in my heart and my life. Crying out and letting God sensitize us towards the things. Either way, if it's you doing something, they've done something to them, or they do something to you, go and be reconciled. We know that Romans 12, 17, another great verse to write down. Romans 12, 12 17 says, repay no one for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. Verse 18, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. If possible, if possible, sometimes it's not possible. Sometimes you're dealing with unreasonable, unwilling people. Amen. Who are not willing to reconcile, not willing to take your calls, not willing to talk. And they just want to hold it against you. Listen, our job is to be obedient to God and to seek peace the way that we would want to have peace sought towards us. Amen. Amen but we can't be responsible for how people react, but we're responsible to our Lord. Amen. Be peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. Amen. It's a hard call. And, and I, I would also say from experience, this me, people might not respond. People might need a little time to work on stuff. You know, we might need to work through things. Sometimes there needs to be a little gap of time, but is there the pursuit of reconciliation. We don't want to use those things as an excuse. You know, when you get to Matthew 18, again, when there's a Mars colony, when we get to Matthew 18, <laughs> Jesus is going to talk about church discipline and he's going to say, Hey, if you got a problem with your brother, you go, you, you just, you two, you just go to it and work it out. And if they don't listen to you, bring someone else, bring someone else. If they don't listen, bring the, for the church. And if they don't listen, you, you excommunicate them from the church. Right. And Jesus' whole teaching there is, is based upon Peter asking, how many times do I forgive my brother? Seven times? Or Jesus says, no, I tell you, 70 times seven. And then he tells a parable. And the parable is about a wicked servant, basically a servant who had had great debt against a king. I've shared this with you before. And, and what happens is the king... He, 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 he has mercy upon this guy who was in just incredible debt. Life's worth, lifetime's worth of debt towards this king. And the king forgives him. And then that guy goes out and he has someone who owes him something like a, a, a year's wage or something like that. And he extracts every single bit from that guy and he can't pay it. And he pushes down on him and is heavy handed with him and does not forgive him. Even though he cried out the same way that he cried out to his master, Right. And Jesus, you get to the end of this and Jesus says, listen, the, the master heard about that. He pulled him in and he threw him in jail until he would repay every last penny. And the, the point is there that he couldn't repay it. And Jesus ends it at the end of Matthew 18 and says, unless you forgive your brother from the heart, so my heavenly father will do with you. I wasn't joking. Go be reconciled. Remember the grace given you. In verse 25, the second example, it says, come to terms quickly with your accuser 
while you're going to him with court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Same imagery of Matthew 18. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Again, both examples, leave your gift at the altar or, hey, go with your accuser on the way. In other words, you are guilty. Don't let that sit. You've done something wrong. Don't let it sit. Go deal with it right away. Like before you get to court, the idea is someone's going to take you to court over what you've done or what you've said or however that is. Don't even let it get to that. Number one, because you want to honor God in, 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 in reconciliation. But number two, you don't want to drag his name through the mud in a public place. Read Corinthians. They got first Corinthians. They got in trouble for that, for bringing one another to the, the courts, the legal courts before Gentiles and before the rulers, they were dragging Jesus's name through the mud. It's like, deal with this in house, go take care of it right away. But letting anger fester for anyone's not an option. And here Jesus is speaking to the one who's guilty quickly come to terms with them. In other words, deal with it right away. Don't let it become a public situation. And Jesus says, if you don't address it, the accuser, the lawyer's going to make his case and you're going to get handed over to the judge and the judge is going to hand you over to the jailer. And the jailer is going to throw you in prison and you're not going to get out. So how many of us push off conflict resolution? Jesus says, do you know the end of this? The end is a prison you can't get out of either for you or for them. So deal with anger now, not then is the picture reconcile now before judgment comes. And obviously this parallels the second one parallels to the Lord. Who's the accuser here? I know the accuser of the brethren and all that type of stuff, right? We, we want to make sure the devil is the accuser. That's different. But I think what God is saying here is, listen, if you're guilty of this before God, I mean, people who live like this and let this perpetuate, people who allow this to go on in their hearts, they don't have a righteousness that exceeds the kingdom. They, they aren't kingdom kids. Makes sense. Like God deals with this stuff in our hearts. He brings it up. I know I'm kind of teetering on, you know, oh, can I lose my salvation if this has been gone? Listen, don't even deal with that. Just re obey. I mean, Jesus makes it really uncomfortable for us to say, you can continue to live like this and I'll accept you no matter what. That's not how he phrases stuff in scripture. He says, this is who my people are. And he just like does a shot across the bow. My people are those who forgive. Are we perfect in forgiveness? No, we're not. Do we let anger, you know, listen, what did Jesus say at the beginning of this? Those who, te who, who make my laws less than what they are and, and they kind of relax on them. You're going to be least in the Kevin in, in the kingdom of heaven. So guess what? Reconcile. Don't let anger go in your heart. Jesus demands absolute obedience in this area. Church. Amen. Starting with me. Make sense. And I don't understand that. You know, Jesus is, is saying, listen, I'll do this to each of you. If you do not obey me in forgiveness in Matthew 18 and here the picture of, listen, if you let this go on in your heart, you're going to be put in a jail. You can't get out of that's an imagery of hell. That's that's here in scripture. I don't, you know, so wrestle with that with me, will you? And, and the interpretation is not like, oh, you know, whatever. It's serious. And so I think there's an analogy there because the debtor's prison is the picture here, a parallel with hell. So when God says don't murder, it's not just the act. It's God's requirement that we have a pure heart before him, before one another. Well, where do you get the pure heart? Well, I hopefully... This is all driving us to the one who gives us a pure heart. Amen. The righteousness that exceeds that of 
the Pharisees, the one who will empower us to do what he's commanded us, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, a righteousness that exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees, not wearing a t-shirt that says, I have not murdered, yay. Right? I keep this one. But rather not allowing anger in our hearts towards our brothers and sisters, whether they be in this church or our fellow countrymen or wherever it might be seeking reconciliation. Amen. The second illustration, he goes on about adultery and it's more of the same. And we'll, we'll tie those in together next week with divorce and all these issues that kind of tie it together there. But we come together as a, as a church, the first Sunday of every month to celebrate communion. <laughs> yeah. So the exhortation is if you come to the altar, I'm not manipulating. I'm just saying if we've got stuff going in our hearts, you know, unforgiveness, let's just take a few minutes and square it away before the Lord. And if you need to go talk to someone and ask for forgiveness or start the reconciliation process, you need to step out of the room and make a call or do an email or whatever it is. Worship the God, worship God in spirit and truth. Amen. Don't let this stuff go. It's really serious. This is, this is his kingdom. This is how his kids live. We walk in the light with one another. Amen. And our fellowship is in light. Amen. And I love this about the Lord. Perhaps you're a person who has anger in your life. Man, if we confess our sin to the Lord, guess what he does? He is faithful to cleanse us. All right. Forgive us from all unrighteousness. Lord, you're our hope. Lord, we fall short in these areas. Lord, there's so much to be angry at these days, and we see it manifested all around us, and, and it's demonic in nature, God. It's selfish in so many ways. And while we point the finger at others who are acting out their rage, unrestrained, uncontrolled, Lord, do we ourselves have this anger that you're talking about in our hearts, Lord? Do we speak about one another or fellow countrymen in this way, God? Do we insult? Do we slander? Lord, forgive us and cleanse us. And Lord, thank you for the hope that you have rose and conquered the grave. You've risen and conquered the grave that we no longer have to live in this, that you've given us your spirit. And those who keep in step with the spirit, we fulfill the law of love, Lord. May we keep in step with your spirit and not play Christianity, Lord, but be the true followers of Jesus Christ in spirit and in truth. So Lord, as we come to your table and we remember your body that was broken for us, Lord, you were broken for our sins, Lord, and your blood was shed to take away our sins, God. And you didn't just want to leave us there with just forgiveness, but you rose again, Lord, that we would have new life. Lord, may we walk in newness of life. Thank you for paying the debt. And thank you for your spirit that is now within us that we might walk in obedience. So lead us, God. Convict us, move us, soften our hearts towards your will. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.